Stock buybacks, a phrase that may mystify the public, but for those in finance, it's a superpower. We are tracking stock buybacks. The comeback of the buyback. Chevron plans a massive $75 billion buyback. The buyback, it was juicy. Everyone was excited about the buyback. You're stepping up buybacks. You've laid off 10% of the workforce. Look, we're just still just getting started here at Salesforce. Over $1 trillion was invested in stock buybacks last year. Trillion, with a T. So why is everyone obsessed with stock buybacks? That's one of the hottest debates on Wall Street right now. Our stock buybacks just a smart tactic to improve shareholder value? <laughs> or are they a fancy bit of market magic? Guardian Leviosa. A trick to enrich wealthy insiders at the expense of workers and the country's future. I'm Eric Gardner, and I cover business at More Perfect Union. Today, we're going to unpack stock buybacks. A standard definition of stock buybacks goes something like this. When companies have extra money, management takes the excess cash and purchases its own shares from the stock market. When they do this, the number of shares on the market is reduced. This often boosts a metric called earnings per share. When metrics like earnings per share increase, investors decide that the stock is worth more. So the stock price rises. Some of that might sound like gibberish. So try to think of stock buybacks as a big pot of soup. The fewer people that can eat out of it, the bigger the servings will be. For everyone that has a bowl, the pot of soup just got more valuable, even though the amount of soup in the pot is exactly the same. The soup doesn't taste better, there's not more soup, all the perceived value increase is on paper. If this sounds ridiculous, it's because it kind of is. It's why so many people consider stock buybacks nothing more than financial engineering. Proponents, who are mostly large shareholders, love buybacks. They get more soup without having to spend more money. Here's an example. From 2018 to 2020, Apple spent $200 billion buying back around 2.5 billion shares worth of stock. So what that means is, if you're a regular investor with, let's say, 10 shares of Apple stock, you used to own 10 out of 20 billion shares. After Apple bought back its stock, you now own 10 out of 17.5 billion. That's immaterial. You might as well be some dandruff on Tim Cook's shoulder. But if you're Warren Buffett, whose company Berkshire Hathaway owned around 1 billion shares of Apple stock, it's worth billions. The company actually saw its ownership share of Apple increase despite selling $11 billion worth of stock during that time. Because of stock buybacks, Berkshire Hathaway shareholders found themselves owning 10% more of Apple without spending a penny. Now's the time when you're probably asking yourself, how is this allowed? Well, for decades, it was actually a big no-no for companies to purchase their own stocks. Three years of unprecedented depression have brought poverty and hunger. Buybacks helped cause the Great Depression. So the government recognized the practice for what it was, market manipulation. They passed a law to ban stock buybacks. But then, in 1982, a man named John Shad entered the chat. He's an unelected bureaucrat in the Reagan administration, and he had a brilliant insight. When it comes to business, shareholders are all that matter. Buybacks meant higher stock prices and more money for shareholders. So buybacks were good. And just like that, they were legal. As weird as it sounds, this shuffling of paper transformed America. Once upon a time, there was a pact between American corporations and the country that sustained them. A promise to not only make money, but also to reinvest in the future. Innovating new technologies, erecting new factories, and creating much needed, well-paying jobs. And there was still a place for shareholders in all of this. They were paid in dividends, a way for a company to reward long-term investing. Directors determine the amount of dividends, if any, to be paid out of earnings to the stockholders. But with the return of stock buybacks, shareholders could make big money by selling, not investing, at the new inflated prices. In the early 90s, executives preferred dividends to buybacks by about a two to one ratio. Now it's almost the opposite. Long-term investing is out of fashion. So is investing in workers in the future. Just take a look at this chart. In 1994, major companies were dropping over $6 on physical equipment for every dollar they spent on stock buybacks. Nowadays, they're only shelling out 94 cents on new stuff for every dollar they spend buying back their own shares. It turns out there's a personal reason why buybacks became so prevalent. Executives got in on the deal. Company boards, who are often paid with stock, started to tie executive compensation to stock performance. The idea is that an executive and the board will be more committed to the company if they have a direct financial stake in its value. But in practice, it means that the people who are deciding where the money is spent get more money if they spend it on stock buybacks even if that comes at the expense of the long-term health of the business. The truth is, if you look back, and I was director of the company, but Coca-Cola kept repurchasing their shares at a time when it didn't make sense, if you look at it. That's Warren Buffett, 
He's admitting that when he was on the board of Coca-Cola, they bought back stock when it wasn't in the company's best financial interest. So why didn't he say anything? God, they made me a ton of money. Uh, and and if, if you belch too often at the dinner table, you don't get invited to parties anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty big corporate governance problem, and it's also among the major drivers of income inequality. The year before buybacks were legal, the median CEO to worker pay ratio was 40 to one. In 2020, it was 350 to one. The dramatic rise of stock buybacks isn't some unavoidable circumstance. This is a choice that we're all living with. Nowhere is this more apparent than in energy. Energy giant Chevron made headlines when they announced plans to invest $10 billion in low-carbon energy by 2028. A year later, management turned around and announced they would spend $75 billion on stock buybacks, or about $17 billion a year for the foreseeable future. If money talks, then it's telling us the priorities of Chevron. Not a higher paid workforce or affordable energy, not clean energy technology that could help save the planet and make billions in the process. It's stock buybacks. So where do we go from here? There are three different camps of people who are grappling with this question. The first camp views buybacks as a superpower. Everything is fine the way it is because corporations exist to benefit shareholders and buybacks benefit shareholders. The second camp says that we need to tax buybacks. A pretty diverse set of people take this view. You know, no one's a fan of more taxes, but of all the taxes you're trying to create, I think a tax on, on buybacks is a good idea, actually. They acknowledge that buybacks are causing harm by failing to invest in workers or the future. They use the record profits to buy back their own stock, rewarding the CEOs and shareholders. Corporations ought to do the right thing. This approach is gaining momentum. There was a provision in the Inflation Reduction Act that added a 1% tax on buybacks. It had a limited impact on corporate behavior. But now, there's talk about upping it to 4%. That's why I propose we quadruple the tax on corporate stock buybacks and encourage long-term long investments. Most experts agree that this would actually change some behavior. The last camp is pushing for a simpler solution, ban stock buybacks. They can point to nearly 50 years of history as precedent. But that doesn't mean they won't face an uphill battle politically. Wherever you fall on the spectrum, it's important that we have this conversation. Because if we don't, unelected bureaucrats like John Shad will answer for us. And we won't like the results.